charge. Thank you so much, Chief Justice Parker, and thank you to the court for coming here and being here with us today as we celebrate not only the grand convocation of the Alabama State Bar, but also the bicentennial of the Alabama Supreme Court. It is an honor to bring greetings on behalf of the Alabama State Bar from this wonderful place. Here in the Heflin Torbert Judicial Building in the Supreme Court courtroom is truly a beautiful place to be. We do want to mention that Justice Shaw and Justice Bryan cannot be here with us today, and we certainly miss their presence here with us as we celebrate, but we appreciate everyone else for being here. Now I'd like to turn it back over to Chief Justice Parker for the State of the Judiciary Address. Last year, the state of Alabama celebrated its bicentennial. While the Constitution of 1819 created the Alabama Supreme Court, the court did not actually meet until May of 1820. So the bicentennial of the Alabama Supreme Court occurred last month in the midst of the coronavirus shutdown and therefore passed without proper recognition. The court greatly appreciates the bar providing the recognition of that landmark during this convocation today. When the founding court met 200 years ago, it did not have a home, so it met in rented space. In the ensuing years, courthouses have been built in every county, and the Heflin Torbett Judicial Building has been built for the three appellate courts. But in many ways, this current crisis has taken the courts out of those buildings for the interim. For the initial two months of the crisis, we had no in-person proceedings. It forced us to find new and innovative ways to conduct hearings, so we moved to virtual hearings online, utilizing the same technology through which the Alabama State Bar Convention is coming to you now. Since the end of March, Alabama courts have had virtual hearings in 19,800 cases. This has enabled us to meet our constitutional responsibility to keep the courts open. The justices of the Alabama Supreme Court have reacted quickly to the crisis by issuing orders that have changed the way that we conduct court across the state. Utilizing emergency powers we have made temporary changes to rules and procedures necessary for operating in this new virtual environment. The Bar Association has collaborated with the courts in reviewing and recommending permanent changes that the Supreme Court should adopt to continue virtual operations in the future. This court recognizes that virtual hearings are here to stay, in large part due to the benefits that are provided to the Bar by preventing lawyers from having to drive long distances for only a short hearing. We have set September 15th as the aspirational date for the resumption of jury trials. Only time will tell whether the crisis has diminished enough by then to reopen the courts fully. We must have the assurance that we can provide a safe environment for jurors and the parties and their counsel as well as the judges and the court personnel. We also face structural obstacles in that so many of the courtrooms around the state do not have sufficient, state, uh, sufficient space to provide appropriate social distancing for jurors and participants. There is a role for your local bar associations to play in working with your local judges and clerks to determine how to make necessary accommodations to safely restart jury trials. After a six-month hiatus on jury trials, once we reopen the gates, trial judges are going to be unable to keep pace with the accumulated deluge. This problem will be compounded by the fact that the court system is short 19 judgeships, according to our weighted caseload studies. We have tried to get a temporary fix for this shortage, this shortage passed by the legislature. It's called the Interim Judges Bill. It will allow us to bring back retired judges who can retain their retirement 
and be paid one-fourth of the current salary for their level of experience on the bench. Even though it passed the House of Representatives unanimously, it was lost when the coronavirus crisis shut down the legislative session. Now, with the building backlog of jury trials, the need is even greater than before. This is a way to get experienced judges back on the bench to help us work our way through the mounting number of trials. I want to personally thank the bar for your continuing assistance in the legislature on this critical piece of legislation. The sudden advent of the crisis has injected such uncertainty into the state's revenues and the budgets built upon those funds that had, it has delayed this court's plan to rebuild the Alabama judiciary, which has never recovered from the devastating budget cuts of 2003. In today's changed societal context, we vitally need to restore courtroom security after we lost our court bailiff 17 years ago. This is just one of the many needs that we have to put flesh back on the bones of the system and to get it smoothly and efficiently functioning again. Additionally, we face a growing problem with access to justice. The bar has done a wonderful job through its volunteer lawyers program, but it cannot begin to even scratch the surface of the mushrooming number of pro se litigants in the court system. As Chief Justice, I want to work with the bar to devise new programs and approaches to complement the volunteer lawyers program. The first priority of government set forth in the preamble of the Constitution of Alabama is to establish justice. We must have a fully staffed and fully funded judiciary to provide the mechanism for you as lawyers to fulfill your role in achieving justice for your clients. I, as Chief Justice, and all of the justices on this court, look forward to working with you, the Alabama Bar, to make the establishment of justice more than a mere aspiration. It is a goal that we all devotedly pursue. Thank you, Madam President. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chief Justice Parker, and to all of the members of the court for your guidance and wisdom through this pandemic. It certainly is unprecedented, and your leadership has been valued by all of the members of the Alabama State Bar, so thank you. As I mentioned, this is the bicentennial of the Alabama Supreme Court, and so last week I came over and met with Tim Lewis, who's the law librarian of the Alabama Supreme Court, and we have a quick video to show you about some of the treasures that are here in the Supreme Court building for you to see. We're so excited to be celebrating the bicentennial of the Alabama Supreme Court this year in 2020. And so with us today, we have Tim Lewis. Tim, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do here with the Supreme Court. I am the law librarian for the Supreme Court. Um, have been the director of the library for almost 25 years. And part of my job is to keep up with the history of the court. And our court has extremely rich history. Um, where we are now is called the Antebellum Gallery. Uh, everything here relates to the court before the war between the states. So when we're talking about the bicentennial, uh, this is where we're gonna find artifacts and portraits about our uh, first court session in, in 1820. Well, I know that the state of Alabama celebrated its bicentennial last year. Right. Mm -hmm. So the state was formed in 1819. Right. And then the next year, I guess in 1820, is when the Supreme Court started meeting or was formed. Right. The, the court actually, the five judges were elected in 1819 on December 14th, um, but they were circuit judges. And so when they took office in January, they, had, they held their circuit courts but twice a year they were required to meet as the Supreme Court. So their first meeting as the Supreme Court was May 8, 1820. So in 1820, who were our five Supreme Court justices? We had uh, Abner Lipscomb, we had Reuben Saffold, um, Henry Young Webb, Richard Ellis, and Clement Comer Clay. 
and they came from all over the state. How did that they work did. if they were circuit judges? If they had an, how could you appeal from one of their decisions? Well, when when they met as a Supreme Court and you were discussing their opinion, they had to recuse themselves, leaving only four justices, which could end up in a tie. I bet there were some interesting decisions in the early 1800s. There were, well, there were, yes, very much so. So um, how long did we have those five Supreme Court justices? Um, We, uh, in 1832, um, the General Assembly amended the Constitution, and one of the things they did was they created a separate Supreme Court of three justices, and they were no longer circuit judges and didn't have to ride circuit. That probably made it a little easier for those justices to I, hear the appeal. I think you're absolutely right, and none of them enjoyed riding circuit, which was extremely arduous at that time. Sure, I guess to ride circuit, it, it, there wasn't much transportation available, and so you'd have to spend a long time out on the road. Right, not at all. I mean, roads were rudimentary and very rough if there were any. River transportation would have been there, but basically it was by horseback, I would assume. So tell us about um, Justice Clay, one of our first Supreme Court justices. Justice Clay uh, was the youngest of the uh, judges in the first uh, session, and they elected him the first day as the chief justice of of the court. He was 31 years old. Um, He later resigned, um, then then was still active in politics, and later became governor of the state. Wow, so that's a pretty rich history yeah. for himself. Mm-hmm. Why don't you show us around the Amazon okay. room and tell okay. us some Great. of the things that we have um, on Great. available to see here? Well, the first thing I want to show you is the first um, record of the court um, from 1820. Um, as you know, uh, when court's in session, someone they make a record. Uh, the record is certified. Uh, this has beautiful handwriting. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen cursive quite so so good. The court had no employees, remember, except the clerk. The clerk, John Taylor, was appointed on the first um, day when uh, Clement Comer Clay was appointed chief justice. Taylor was appointed clerk. And we can only guess that Taylor, this is Taylor's handwriting, uh, and it's beautifully done and meticulous. Uh, and in, in particularly good shape for something 200 years old. And where did they meet when they first um, had court? Interestingly enough, they, they met in a house of a gentleman named William Pye. Um, William Pye was a businessman. He ran a grocery store later in, in Cahaba. And that's where they met. And the only reason they know we met there is in December of uh, 1820, the legislature passed an act paying Mr. Pye $20 for the Supreme Court's use of his house. Now, we have no clue where his house is, and Cahaba's archaeologists have been looking for 35 years, but no one has been able to find any record of where that house was. Oh, wow. So in 1826, they moved to Tuscaloosa, right? They did, yes. Mm -hmm. And was that the first time they had an official courtroom? It is. How long was the Supreme Court the only appellate court that we had? I think the Court of Appeals was created in 1915, if I'm not mistaken. So that was the first time we had another court that heard appeals. What else do we have in the antebellum room? Well, um, let's, over on this side, we've got portraits of two of our first, um, the first five justices. We don't have likenesses of all of them. This is Abner Smith Lipscomb, who was um, the judge of the First Circuit. Uh, Judge Lipscomb um, moved to Texas uh, after he left office in Alabama and served on the Supreme Court of Texas, and they have a portrait in their courtroom just like this one. I think theirs may be a little lighter, but he, he went on to Texas, which was not unusual for the time, um, but he, was, he, he later became Chief Justice before he moved to Texas. And then we have Reuben Saffold, who also um, became Chief Justice, and uh, Saffold was from, I mean, he lived in Dallas County and uh, had a, I think, a house that still is, um, survives in Dallas County. Um, but these are the two that we have right now displayed here. How many Chief Justices have we had on the court um, since the beginning? <laughs> that's a great question because I was just looking at that today. We have had, in my count, we've had 34. 
Um, if you look at Wikipedia, they count 35 because they count at an acting chief justice in, in their list. I, um, we don't, so we've had 35. 34. 34, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's do, we okay. need, do we need that again? No. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. One, one of the, the neatest things that we have is this portable lap desk that belonged to Henry Young Webb, one of our first five judges. Uh, this uh, desk, made in the late 1700s, is made of mahogany and uh, it has got a rosewood veneer and it's got brass insets. It folds up and closes, and so it's sort of like a, a laptop in a way, and we don't know that uh, Judge Webb used this as his court bench, but it's quite possible he did, because there were really no courthouses as such, in, you know, in, in Alabama, because Alabama was really the frontier, uh, so they would, he would probably keep papers, whatever, in here, fold it up, put it in a leather bag, back of a mule, and he would, off he would go uh, all around his circuit. Now, unfortunately, uh, Judge Webb died in 1823 of an illness he caught on, from riding circuit, which was certainly one of the hazards um, because it was really rough to, to ride circuit. Well, that's fascinating. If someone wanted to visit the antebellum room, how could you go about arranging a visit? Uh, you could schedule a tour through uh, the law library. Um, it's basically the best way to go about it. Um, you can tour it. We do tours of the whole building, um, especially fourth grade students, because we want to show them how the appellate courts work, because everybody's familiar with the trial courts, but appellate courts, as you know, are different, and so we try to educate them on that. And, you know, they can see the Annabelle Gallery at that time. That's great. Well, thank you so and much. And we do want to thank right. Tim again. Yeah. He's so knowledgeable. Yeah. If you have a chance to check the antebellum room out before you leave, it's to my left, and it's beautiful. The, the treasures that are there are really wonderful. Next, I'd like to call on Rebecca McKinney. Um, one of the privileges of being the president of the Alabama State Bar is that you get to choose your vice president. And Rebecca has, was kind enough to agree to serve as my vice president this year. She has done an amazing job. She practices law up in Huntsville and is a full-time mom to three beautiful sons and and even kicked them out of their room to let me stay there a few times when I was visiting in Huntsville. So Re Rebecca, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christy. You know, the honor has been all mine getting to be your vice president. So thank you very much. I think you have done an outstanding job as president and have led us through the toughest year that I think we've probably ever had. And I think everybody can admire that greatly and should and should recognize how hard you have had to work um, and and not had all the fun parts of being president towards the end. So um, anyway, I've been asked to talk to uh, y'all about the 50-year pens and certificates. We have about 80 um, lawyers who will be uh, receiving these um, who've made it 50 years, which is quite an accomplishment. I think anybody who practices law knows that if you've made it 50 years practicing law, you've worked really hard your whole life, and so we're very proud to do that. We're not going to name each one of those people individually, but we will be sending a certificate um, with with the uh, their name and signed by Christy and Philip or uh, Bob and Philip. I'm not sure which one signs it. And then you'll be getting a pen that says 50 years of service um, with the Alabama State Bar. And we'll also be highlighting all of our 50-year pen recipients on all of our social media and digital uh, publications. So anyway, I, let's give a round of applause to all of those lawyers who have made it 50 years. Thank you again, Rebecca. The president also gets to have president's awards. And sometimes a president will have one or two. I like to overdo things with awards sometimes. And so I have a number of recipients, but I want to tell y'all why these folks are receiving the award. The first two I'm going to tell you about are Marcus Maples and Judge Kelly Pate. Marcus and Judge Pate chaired our Diversity and Inclusion Committee this year. They started the year by recommending that we change the name of the committee from the Diversity Committee to Diversity and Inclusion in the Profession Committee to reflect what we are truly trying to accomplish. They then kicked off the Big Ideas campaign, the goal of which was to come up with new ideas for the Alabama State Bar and its members to increase diversity and inclusion efforts. The results included new ideas for pipeline programs, 
CLE programs to assist minority growth in firms, LGBTQ outreach, and new resources for the bar. These were presented at the May 1st bar commissioner meeting, and we are already working on implementing some of these very good ideas. I'd also like to give Marcus a big shout out for helping us plan the annual meeting and putting together some speakers for the annual meeting that we had yesterday. Thank you to Marcus and Kelly Pate. The next group of recipients are Robert Shreve, Ryan Dupletchen, and Linda Lunn. Robert Shreve served as the Young Lawyers President this year, and when the pandemic hit, these lawyers began a disaster legal assistance hotline to help those in need as a result of the pandemic. Their leadership in this space helped not only people affected by the pandemic, but is paving the road for future assistance when there is a natural disaster or other catastrophic need. In addition, Linda Lund has been working diligently to expand our Wills for Heroes program to recognize the heroes of the pandemic, which are our health care providers. Under Linda's leadership, volunteer lawyers now have the ability to provide simple wills and powers of attorney to health care workers across the state, showing our appreciation for those who have put their lives on the line for us all during the pandemic. Next, we have Brandon Buck, Susan Hahn, and Emily Hornsby. Many of you know that health and wellness has been one of the focuses of my presidency. When I reached out to Brandon Buck to help me chair this committee, I'm not sure that's the exact call he was expecting to get. But I paired him up with Emily and Susan, and they have done amazing things to bring awareness to the mental health and stress disorders that affect lawyers at a higher than normal rate. This year, they rolled out a weekly social media campaign, proclaimed May as Mental Health and Wellness Month with daily challenges for our members, and provided three free virtual CLEs in the month of May to talk more about mental health and wellness. They have brought much needed conversations and reduced stigma around getting help when you need it. They have changed people's lives and I appreciate that. Our next three recipients are Manish Patel, Brian Murphy, and Davis Smith. About a year and a half ago, Manish Patel approached me at a BBC meeting and said, Christy, we need health care for our members. We need an insurance program. I was like, Manish, I've always heard we can't do that. He said, well, you need to make it happen. I couldn't make it happen because that's not my area. But I did reach out to Brian Murphy, who is with the Mobile County Bar and had implemented a program for them, and Davis Smith, who's here in Montgomery, who is an association guru. And so I talked to them, and together we now have a health insurance program that's going to be rolled out on August 1st. So if you are needing health insurance through Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama, you can associate with our association plan and obtain health insurance through there and hopefully get a better rate. They were the chairs of the, the insurance benefit committee. And so in addition to that, they also rolled out a cybersecurity insurance plan to help our members who need cybersecurity help. Next, we have Jimbo Terrell and George Parker. There are some people that think that the Alabama State Bar doesn't do anything other than discipline people and collect dues. That is not true, and we know that here in this room. But I wanted to make sure people knew all of the things that we were doing and to increase our member benefits. So I challenged Jimbo and George and said, I want a new member benefit rolled out at every bar commissioner meeting. Well, not only did they meet that challenge, they did much more. Over the last year, we have rolled out 10 new member benefits. And that means our total to over 35 member benefits. So if you're not familiar with our member benefits, I urge you to log into your account at this Alabama State Bar, get behind the wall, because that's where all the discounts are, and find out what discounts are available, because there are many of them. Next, we have Gibson Vance. Lawyers are great at helping their clients and those in need, but oftentimes we don't help each other. Gibson and I were talking about this problem last year and brainstorming on solutions when he mentioned the TAG program that Troy State University has and the tags that are on the back of the cars and how much income those generated. From this conversation came Lawyers Render Service, Inc. This is a new nonprofit corporation that will be funded with the proceeds of the sale of car tags to Alabama lawyers and others. The proceeds will be used to help Alabama lawyers who have unexpected challenges which we all have had over the last few months. I cannot wait to see the tags on the back of all of your cars in the years to come. Next, we have Kitty Brown from Birmingham. Now, many of you may remember that Kitty Brown was um, called the shadow president to Augusta Dowd. 
We have been fr friends through our service to the bar for a long time, but I had no idea how valuable it would be to just have someone who had experience working with a bar president to bounce ideas off of. And oh yeah, she is an amazing lawyer, past president of the Young Lawyers, co-chair of the Consolidated Fundraising Task Force, worked with the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, and helped us find speakers for our first ever virtual annual meeting that we had yesterday. While she may not be my shadow president, she is definitely a rock star by all who know her, and I appreciate her service. Next, we have Morris Lilienthal. There are some people that you know, and you don't really know how you know them or why you know them, and Morris is like that in my life. I met him through mutual friends at a CLE several years ago, and I'm in Hun Union Springs and he's in Huntsville, so we had no reason really to become friends. But we did, mainly because I admired the way that he was reaching out on social media to his community and starting new conversations. A couple of years ago, we were talking on my way home one afternoon, and it struck me. I want the Alabama State Bar to tell the stories of lawyers. Thus, with the inspiration of Morris Lilienthal and the help of Melissa Warnke, our wonderful new communications director, More Than a Lawyer was born. Over the course of the last year, we have shared the stories of dozens of lawyers who have changed their communities one act at a time. I hope that the Alabama State Bar will continue to share these stories because there are 18,000 members and each of them have a story to share on how they help their community. Greg Ward is our next recipient. Last year, when Greg Ward's name was floated to be the new editor of the Alabama Lawyer, I thought to myself, how can I not know Greg Ward? He's in East Alabama, I'm in East Alabama, we've got to know each other. I did not know Greg before he became the editor of the Alabama Lawyer last year, but I'm so honored to have gotten to know him over the last year. His leadership on the Alabama Lawyer has been amazing, and his thematic issues have been well received, especially the wellness issue that he released in November. His hard work and dedication to the lawyers of the state of Alabama is unprecedented. Finally, we have Ralph Holt and Jeff Bowling. Every year, the bar president gets to choose one location for a, a meeting outside of the city of Montgomery. I pitched the idea to Ralph Holt, Tom Heflin, who's here, and Jeff Bowling that maybe coming to the Quad City area would be good because I'd recently visited there and knew that many of my friends had never been to the northwest corner of the state. Ralph, Tom, and Jeff took the idea and threw a great gathering in Florence in March. Little did we know that that would be our last time all together in person as a bar commission this year. The lawyers in the Quad City area put together a great reception, hosted a wonderful dinner, and we thoroughly enjoyed our trip up there. Thank you so much to all of these amazing lawyers for making this year great. Now speaking of Tom Heflin, next we have to present the William Bill Scruggs Award. This award is given to those members of the Alabama State Bar that have made significant contributions and outstanding long-term service to the bar. It was established in 2002 to honor the memory of and accomplishments on behalf of the bar of the former state bar president, Bill Scruggs. Tom Heflin is an obvious recipient for this award. When I tried to find out all of the things that Tom has done for the bar, it was impossible to list them all, but he's been a commissioner for the last six years, and he co-chaired the 19th Amendment Centennial Celebration Committee for the last three years. He also was a star in the um, premiere of our documentary on the 19th Amendment. So thank you so much, Tom, for your service to the bar and to your community, and would you come receive your award? It's so awkward not to shake hands or to give people hugs. I'm a hugger, so <laughs> congratulations. Thanks. Okay. Thank Thanks. You. Next, we have the um, Tony McLean Award. The Tony McLean Professionalism Award is to honor the leadership of Tony McLean, the longtime um, general counsel for the Alabama State Bar, and to encourage the emulation of his deep devotion to professionalism and service to the Alabama State Bar by recognizing outstanding, long-term, and distinguished service in the advancement of professionalism by living members of the Alabama State Bar. This year, we have two recipients to the, of this award. One is Michael Upchurch, and he cannot be here. Michael Upchurch was the son of a Marine Corps pilot and school teacher graduated from the University of Virginia School of Law while serving as an officer in the United States Army National Guard. 
Michael was admitted to practice law in Alabama in 1983, where he has established himself as one of the best civil defense attorneys and mediators in the country. Michael is a fellow with the American College of Trial Lawyers, the International Academy of Trial Lawyers, the American Board of Trial Advocates, and the International Society of Barristers. He is a perennial super lawyer for business litigation, best lawyer for personal injury litigation, and has been named the, by Best Lawyers the Lawyer of the Year in Mobile for personal injury defense. He has also been named by Super Lawyers one of the top 50 lawyers in Alabama multiple times. Despite his busy schedule, Michael's service to the bar and our profession has been lengthy and wide-ranging. Michael has served as the president of the Mobile Bar Association in 2013, the president and director of the Alabama Defense Lawyers Association, and was the original co-chair of the Mobile Bar Association Diversity Task Force. In addition, Michael has been a member of the Alabama Lawyers Hall of Fame Selection Committee and the Alabama State Bar Diversity in the Profession Committee. In addition to his litigation practice, Michael has represented numerous attorneys pro bono before the disciplinary board of the Alabama State Bar. Michael has been a zealous advocate for his clients while maintaining the highest ethical standards. Michael is currently a member of the Alabama Court of the Judiciary and is a member of the Alabama State Bar Disciplinary Rules and Enforcement Committee. As a member of that committee, Michael has taken on the Herculean task of reviewing and revising the advertising and solicitation rules of the Alabama Rules of Professional Conduct. Many of you know that we put those out, circulated those for comment just in the last couple of months. The work that Michael has done on behalf of our bar, both in representing attorneys before the bar and as a member of numerous committees, has been invaluable toward promoting and maintaining the integrity and professionalism of our bar. Congratulations to Michael Upchurch for winning the Tony McLean Award. Our other recipient of the Tony McLean Professionalism Award is here, and it's Harlan Prater. Harlan graduated from Duke University School of Law in 1987 and was admitted to the Alabama State Bar that same year. Harlan is also admitted in Georgia, Mississippi, and Tennessee. As a partner at Lightfoot Franklin, Harlan is recognized as one of the top defense litigators in the country. He is a member of the American College of Trial Advocates, the International Academy of Trial Lawyers, and the American Board of Trial Advocates. Harlan has been recognized by Chambers USA as a leading lawyer, by Benchmark Litigation as a litigation star, and twice by Best Lawyers as Lawyer of the Year. Despite the heavy demand for his legal acumen, Harlan has volunteered his time on numerous committees of the Alabama State Bar. Harlan has served on the Birmingham Bar Association Executive Committee, served as chair of the board of directors of the Birmingham YMCA, and has served as the chair of the board of trustees for both Canterbury United Methodist Church and the North Alabama Conference of the United Methodist Church. Since 2014, Harlan has been the chair for the Alabama State Bar Disciplinary Rules and Enforcement Committee. While serving as chair, Harlan has led and overseen numerous revisions and amendments to the Alabama Rules of Disciplinary Procedure that have not only modernized our rules, but have also ensured the fairness and efficacy of the disciplinary process. Along with Michael, Harlan has also led the charge to update and revise the advertising and solicitation rules that are currently before the Board of Bar Commissioners. His service to the Bar has been invaluable in promoting and improving the professionalism of our Bar. Congratulations to Harlan Freider. Mr. Chief Justice, fellow justices, Christy, thank you so much. I wanted to say a few things this morning, not about me at all, not about me at all. This is a tremendous honor for which I am very, very grateful. And Tony McLean was one of my dearest friends. Uh, he served this bar with great distinction for many, many years, and he was a giant in our profession. His contributions to our bar are countless. I looked at the prior recipients of this award previously, and Charles Gamble, Sam Crosby, Billy Bedsoul, Percy Batum, Douglas McElvey. I do not belong on that list. And I don't belong on that list this year because the true recipient should be Michael Upchurch. What Michael Upchurch has done for the Alabama State Bar over the past several years in looking at revising and making proposals for changing our rules of professional conduct dealing with lawyer advertising has been monumental. It is remarkable how much time and effort he has put into that 
And it's, it's great to see how it's driven by his brilliance, his commitment, his thoroughness, his remarkably good judgment, and the, his attention to detail. I've told Christian Phillip many times, all I have done with respect to that project is stay out of Michael's way. And it has been fun to watch him do what he does, along with other members of the committee. I'll close with this. I love being a lawyer. I can't imagine doing anything else with my professional life. And I can't thank the Alabama State Bar enough for this tremendous honor. Thank you very much. Congratulations again, Harlan, and you do not give yourself sufficient credit because that has been a Herculean task to get through that, and you've worked very hard on it, and we appreciate that. Next, we have the Commissioner's Award. This award recognizes those who have improved the administration of justice in Alabama. Deb Dunsmore, who is a lawyer up in Scottsboro, Alabama, nominated Judge John Graham for this award, and I cannot think of a better recipient. Judge Graham, if you know him and follow him on social media, which he's very active on, as you know, has been a leader in the community corrections projects. His wellness court is a national um, treasure that have, has been looked at by other places when they're trying to establish a wellness court. His drug court, he continued to have even during the pandemic, both virtually with FaceTime Live and also outside. And I cannot imagine a more well-deserving recipient of the Commissioner's Award than Judge John Graham. Thank you, Judge Graham. Picture first, and then you can say a few words, which will be much more entertaining than any words that I could say. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. You so much. I appreciate it. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Graham. It's my privilege to serve the good people of Jackson County, Alabama, as their circuit judge, one of their circuit judges, and as their drug court judge. If I may correct you, Madam President, my colleague Judge Word is the miracle worker in the wellness court, not I. Um, but I'll take credit, though. Thank you so much for this award. I was very reluctant to come to drug court and to start a drug court. In fact, I flat out refused and came down to Montgomery to explain to Chief Justice Cobb several years ago why we would not be having a drug court in Jackson County. And at the conclusion, she was right up in my face. She said, John, thank you so much for agreeing to start a drug court in Jackson County. I know it's going to be wonderful with you in charge, and it will become the most rewarding thing you've ever done as a lawyer or a judge. Sue Bell Cobb was right, of course. It has become the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my career. Serving those folks who exist and who live on the margins and in the fringes of our society is a wonderful thing, to be a servant and to try to bring those people back into full citizenship, into normality. I was talking just uh, this week with a new drug court judge in Coleman County, and I said, why do you want to be a drug court judge? And he said, because I realize that but for one or two decisions in my life, I could very well be where they are. And likewise, I realize that but for one or two decisions in their lives, they could be sitting where I am. And I said, you know all there is that you need to know to be a successful drug court or wellness court or mental health court or veterans court or accountability court judge with that attitude. So it is indeed an honor to receive this recognition for my work and I accept it on behalf of all those that I serve, all those that we serve. Thank you so much to the bar and to the court. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judge Graham. Our next award goes to Allison Skinner. She is the recipient of the Award of Merit, and this award recognizes outstanding service to the legal profession in Alabama. Allison cannot be here today, but we have a virtual um, receiving of the award where I presented it to her last week. We are here today to honor Allison Skinner, who is the recipient of the 2020 Award of Merit from the Board of Bar Commissioners. The Award of Merit was established in 1966 and recognizes outstanding constructive service to the legal profession in Alabama. And we're so excited to, award, to have that award given to Allison this year 
because I cannot think of a better recipient. Allison is the 54th recipient of this. She has served on the Board of Bar Commissioners for six years. She's the Birmingham Bar uh, Secretary Treasurer. She's also chaired the Alabama State Bar Women's Section and the ADR Section. She was nominated for this award by the Alabama State Bar Women's Section, and we're so excited to be here with you today. I'm sorry that we're not gonna be in person on Friday, but we're glad to be able to award this to you today. Congratulations, Allison. Thank you so much, Christy. I really appreciate it. I can't tell you how much this award and recognition means to me, um, but I gotta tell you, I would not be receiving this award except for the constant support of the Alabama State Bar Women's Section and the Birmingham Bar Women Lawyers Section. I feel like in receiving this award, I'm receiving it really on behalf of both of those groups. Well, you've been an honor to work with in both of those groups. I know, and I know personally for me, our, we got to know each other through the women's section of the Alabama State Bar, okay. and it's been a pleasure to work with you and all those. And I hope okay. to um, get to see you in person soon to tell you congratulations and give you a big hug, but not until everybody's a little safer. So thank you so much for being here to receive this award, and congratulations again. Thank you, Christy. And congratulations to Allison. <laughs> Next, we have the Judicial Award of Merit that is given to Judge Madeline Heikela. The Judicial Award of Merit was established in 1987 and is presented to a judge who is determined to have contributed significantly to the administration of justice in Alabama. Judge Heikela was nominated by the Women's Lawyers Section of the Birmingham Bar Association. In a letter of support, Morgan Franz said of her time working with Judge Heikela, her impressive legal knowledge and attention to detail, combined with her kindness and patience, fostered a collegial environment in which every member of the team felt valued and was motivated to do their best work. While Judge Heikela is known for her sharp analytical mind, she is equally known for her kindness and compassion, both toward the individuals and attorneys that appear before her and toward her staff. She, she applies an impressive intellectual rigor to her work without losing sight of the humanity of the individuals her work impacts. Congratulations to Judge Heikela. Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court. Um, I'm gonna sound a little bit like a broken record. Um, like Harlan, I looked at the list of past recipients of this award and truly do not feel worthy of it. Um, but, you know, my life has been a series of um, just very fortunate events. And I think back to um, when I had the privilege of becoming a magistrate judge. Um, the first day I was on the bench, I actually flew to baby judge school. And on the plane, uh, on one of the planes, I was sitting between Sean Hopwood, Professor Hopwood, who was a law student at the time and was going to help prepare for an argument at the U.S. Supreme Court, and a form, former U.S. Marshal. So I thought, you know, here's the perfect way to prepare for criminal work, which I had never done before, um, because Professor Hopwood told me about his background. And as soon as I was done with that flight, I ordered Lawman and, and read and learned um, a little bit about the experiences of some of the people who had come before me. Um, a little while later, I had my investiture, and Harlan was the master of ceremonies for that investiture. Um, so it's funny to see in moments in your life glimpses of all the great opportunities you've had those opportunities have included incredible mentors, whether it's the lawyers at Lightfoot Franklin who trained me, the lawyers who I litigate, litigated against who taught me how to be a better lawyer because they are so very good. It's the numerous judges and justices um, who graded my work for many years um, and 
taught me how to, to treat litigants fairly and with respect. Um, I could go on and on. I'm so grateful to all the law clerks who any re recognition I get is a recognition of their work, and so I'm so grateful to all of them. And I'm just grateful to the women's section of the bar for this opportunity. They were very kind to nominate me. I thank you all. I had not heard Judge Heikel's story about meeting Sean Hopwood, but for those of you that missed it, yesterday he spoke at our annual meeting virtually, and he was quite interesting. So if you have not heard his story, YouTube him, Google him, or something, and you'll, you'll be fascinated by his story. We have a number of other awards that we are going to present and that we will actually present to somebody in person, hopefully soon. Those include the Jean Marie Leslie Award, which recognizes exemplary service to lawyers in need in the areas of substance abuse or mental health. This year's Jean Marie Leslie Award recipient is Robert Thornhill, the immediate um, past director of our Alabama Lawyers Assistance Program. Congratulations to Robert. <laughs> Next, we have the Mon McClure Kelly Award. This recognizes a female attorney who has made a lasting impact on the legal profession and has been a pioneer and leader within the state. This year's Mon McClure Kelly Award recipient is Augusta Dowd, past president of the Alabama State Bar. Next, we have a number of pro bono awards. Our Albert Vreeland Pro Bono Award is awarded to Peyton Falk of Montgomery, Alabama. She volunteers with the Montgomery Volunteer Lawyers Program and regularly provides assistance at their bi-monthly and lawyer, lawyer for the day clinics. Our Mediator Award is awarded to Susan Donovan in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Susan serves as the Director of the Mediation Law Clinic and volunteers with the Alabama State Bar Volunteer Lawyers Program. Our Law Firm Award is awarded to Gaines, Galt, and Hendricks in Huntsville, Alabama. Attorneys at the Huntsville Office of Gaines, Galt, and Hendricks have been providing assistance to Madison County Volunteer Lawyer Program clients since 2016. During the past four years, the firm has provided assistance, assistance to 75 Madison County VLP clients and contributed over 250 pro bono service hours to those clients. And as the Chief Justice mentioned, we do have very robust volunteer lawyers programs around the state, and this is a great example of one that a firm that's working strongly with those. Our law student award is awarded to Mindy Kidd, who's at the University of Alabama School of Law. While in law school, Mindy has volunteered consistently with the Alabama State Bar Volunteer Lawyer Program's Tuscaloosa Legal Assistance Clinic. She has provided 42 hours of pro bono service, performing client intake, screening clients for eligibility and legal issues prior to their seeing a volunteer lawyer. She is such a regular volunteer that she trains other students in eligibility screening. Our Public Interest Attorney Award goes to James O. Smith of, here in Montgomery. Jim Smith has spent his career expanding access to justice and assisting those who often are forgotten by the legal community. Jim started his career in 1978 as a staff attorney in the Selma Office of the Legal Services Corporation of Alabama, where he represented clients from wide-ranging legal issues, from voting rights to domestic violence to consumer issues. From Selma, Jim moved to the Opelika office and in 1989 moved to the Montgomery Region office, where he was named the managing attorney in 1992. Through the years, Jim has provided assistance to thousands of Alabamians who had nowhere else to turn. He is a relentless advocate for his clients and for the domestic violence community, seeking resources and recognition to this problem most would rather ignore. He's also served as a mentor to hundreds of attorneys around the state in his role as an advocate, supervisor, instructor, manager, and friend. Jim provides an unwavering example of service to his clients, to his community, and to the Alabama State Bar. Congratulations to each of these pro bono award recipients. Our local Bar Achievement Awards go to the Calhoun Cleburne County Bar Association and the Mobile Bar Association, and these will be presented by Bob in person at our next visit for the State of the Bar Address. Congratulations to all of our award winners. <laughs> next, I call on Philip McCallum. So we have one more award, and it is, it is the Susan Bevel Livingston Award, which is being awarded to Christy Crow. This award is presented by the Women's Section in memory of Susan Bevel Livingston, who practiced law at Balch and Bingham. 
The recipient of this award must demonstrate a continual commitment to those around her as a mentor, a sustained level of leadership throughout her career, and a commitment to her community in which she practices, such as, but not limited to, bar-related activities, community service, and or activities which benefit women in the legal field or in her community. There is not another person who I think personifies this award more than you do, Christy, and you have, you have been in leadership in this Bar Association for years and years, and, and the young lawyers before that, and you show up and you're counted, and you do that all while raising two wonderful children and practicing law so successfully. I'm in awe of you, and congratulations, and thank you. I never had the honor of knowing Susan Bevel Livingston, but when we, I was on the women's section when we established that award, and I will say she must have been a amazing lawyer and an amazing woman, and it's certainly an honor to receive this award from the women's section. So thank you, Rebecca. Now we'll call on Philip. <laughs> Well, behind every great leader is a great support system. And trust me, Christy Crow has an amazing support staff uh, with her family and her friends and all her followers. Uh, she is just amazing. But today we do want to recognize uh, one person in her support system, uh, and that is Carmen Sconyers. And Carmen, would you please come up? Is Christy's secretary, it is so difficult to be a bar president and manage all those things in your life that you have to, to, to manage. And Carmen, you have been amazing. On behalf of the Alabama State Bar, we appreciate it. We got you a small token, a certificate oh, of appreciation you. for your wall and, and a candle. And I will warn you that when Christy returns to the office full time, uh, she is prob you're probably going to have to role play with her a little bit because she's going to have to have somebody to interview. So you may have to play Bruce Pearl or somebody else sure and let her do some questions and answers. I'm sure she can. Carmen, thank, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Carmen has been um, so much more than just um, an assistant to me. She is just a friend and she's a wonderful mother and, and she's stuck it out with me for a number of years when I think a lot of people have gone running for the hills, especially this year when we had two jury trials while I was state bar president. And I thought that by the January when we're getting through the second one, I thought she might leave after that one, but we made it and I'm so grateful that we made it together. So, Christy, I'm gonna miss you so bad. You have just been an absolutely amazing leader. I feel like we have talked almost every day this past year. And uh, you just, you were amazing. And a lot of people may not remember this, but, you know, in Christy talking about her vice president, how important it is to pick somebody that you really trust, care about, and whom you respect so much. Many years ago when I was bar president, Christy was my vice president. And uh, so we have been amazing friends for a long time, and it has been such an honor and a wonderful thing for me to watch her walk this amazing path this past year. And there's, there's another group that doesn't go mentioned, uh, that we haven't mentioned a lot, but who also just adore you and think the world of you. And our Alabama State Bar staff uh, got together, and your beautiful family and your picture on the Alabama Lawyer uh, is a small token of the State Bar's appreciation for everything you've done for us. We wanted to give you this. Thank you so Congratulations much. Congratulations and thank you. It is a beautiful family. I'm lucky to have them. Next, we have our president elect. Taz Shepard has been the solo and small firm chair for the last two years. He's also served as a, on the board of bar commissioner for the last six years and served as vice president of the Alabama State Bar last year. So we're so excited to introduce him now as our president elect of the Alabama State Bar. Taz? Please, the court. So proud to be here. 
You know, I am so fortunate in many ways. I have a lovely family, and by kind of happenstance, I chose an area of the law, bankruptcy, where very few lawyers and even very few judges tell me I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's something I've enjoyed greatly, though, my practice, and it's really only within the last 10 years that I've really had an opportunity to apply two things that uh, my grandfather told me, who was a lawyer before he went to Congress. He said, first of all, never assume you're the smartest guy in the room. Always be motivated to try harder. And in this room, I have no trouble with that. I see so many friends, so many leading lights. The other thing is, when you set a goal that's outside of yourself, make sure you can describe why you want to do it without mentioning yourself. Make sure you have the right motives. And what I've heard from the judges and the lawyers that are here before me are exactly the right motives, and that is to help other people, whether it's our fellow lawyers or the judicial system or the public. Those are the right reasons to be involved, to set ego aside and to serve. So I'm so honored to be here, so pleased to see so many friends and future friends here. And I have to say, Judge Graham, when I bought, my wife and I bought a lake house in Gunnersville, he said, you know, that would make a great place for a party. <laughs> so once the pandemic lifts, we'll have the party and y'all come. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Taz. And we're looking forward to your service to the bar, your continued service to the bar. So this is it. Once again, let me say, may it please the court. Approximately a year ago, I stood in a much different room and became the president of an association of professionals that I admire and love. It was the proudest moment of my professional life. On my way home from Point Clear that weekend, I was filled with anticipation and joy, working on fulfilling the plans that I had envisioned since I started this journey many years ago. I had planned my year out and knew exactly what I intended to accomplish. I had promised the members of the Alabama State Bar that we were going to have a great year, and I was determined to keep my promise. It started off just as I planned. We started visiting local bar associations, our first one being with Judge Graham up in Jackson County and in August of that year, just a few weeks after I became president. We shared stories of lawyers from around the state with the help of our communications director, Melissa Warnke, started our More Than a Lawyer campaign, and started highlighting the amazing things that lawyers do in their community. We approved new, new member benefits at every bar commissioner meeting. We honored our lawyers who passed away with the opening of courts in this very courtroom. We had our first mid-year meeting in over 30 years, which we had planned to be a low-cost alternative to our annual meeting. And thanks to the court's agreement to have a joint meeting, we had the opportunity to have a joint reception with the judges from around the state. We hired a new ALAP director in Jeremy Rakes, we continued our regular meetings with the Alabama Supreme Court and improving our relationship with the court. We were lining up for an amazing spring, but as you all know, life is what happens when you're busy making plans, and 2020 has shown us that more than anything. 2020 reminds me of a story I read from the mother of a disabled child. It's called Welcome to Holland, and she describes in her story that having a baby is like planning a fabulous vacation to Italy. You buy a bunch of guidebooks, you make your wonderful plans, the Colosseum, the Michelangelo David, the gondolas in Venice. You may learn some very handy phrases in Italian. It's all very exciting. And after months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives, you pack your bags, and off you go. Several hours later, the plane lands, and the stewardess comes in and says, welcome to Holland. Holland? I don't, what do you mean, Holland? I'm going to Italy. All my life I've dreamed about going to Italy. But there's a change in the flight plan. They've landed in Holland, and there you must stay. The important thing is that they haven't taken you to a horrible, disgusting place. It's just a different place. So you must go out and you buy new guidebooks, you learn a new language, and you meet a whole new group of people that you would never have met. It's just a different place. Maybe it's slower paced. Maybe it's less flashy than Italy, but after you've been there a while and you catch your breath, you look around and you begin to notice that Holland has windmills and Holland has tulips. Holland even has Rembrandts. So instead of mourning the fact that you didn't get to go to Italy, you learn to enjoy 
the very special and lovely things about Holland. So when the pandemic hit, I had a choice. Was I going to spend the final four months of my presidency mourning the loss of the presidency that I had planned, or was I going to continue to serve the profession that I love when lawyers needed us more than ever? I chose the latter, and with the help of the amazing Alabama State Bar staff, Philip McCallum, and who's the most amazing executive director ever, let me put that aside in there, and lawyers from around the state, I want to tell you what we've done since the pandemic. We presented 11 webinars on managing the pandemic, working remotely, keeping the courts open, wellness during stressful times, and more. We held our first ever virtual Board of Bar Commissioners meeting, at which we had over 90% of our commissioners attend virtually. We presented the Big Ideas campaign that I've already talked about from Marcus and Judge Pate. We premiered a documentary on women's suffrage in Alabama. We provided information to teachers around the state on women's suffrage for a virtual Law Day celebration. We welcomed our new spring 2020 admittees, virtually, of course. We helped the Young Lawyers section set up a disaster hotline. We started the Wills for Heroes program for the new heroes of the pandemic, the healthcare workers around our state. We offered three free virtual CLEs on health and wellness that counted for your annual ethics CLE and had a virtual wellness challenge for the month of May. We kicked off our sponsorship for the association health care plan so that our members can purchase health insurance through the association from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama. We had a virtual legal food frenzy and raised over $32,000, which translates to 160,000 meals for the people in the state of Alabama. We worked with a court system on the COVID-19 bench and bar task force to make recommendations on how to navigate court appearances and trials post-pandemic or during a pandemic. And just yesterday, we hosted the largest annual meeting in the history of the Alabama State Bar, which had significantly different discounted CLE for all of our members and which hopefully a lot of you attended. I did not do this alone. I could not have done it alone. Instead, we did this. We did this together. And because we worked together, even when we couldn't be in the same room, our profession is better and our state is better. The work of the Alabama State Bar continues, and under the leadership of incoming President Bob Methan and President-elect Taz Shepard, it will continue to be strong. Thank you to the staff of the Alabama State Bar. Again, Philip McCallum's vision and leadership for the Alabama State Bar cannot be said enough how impressive that is. He comes up with ideas and I think, that's a little crazy, but let's try it, and then it works. So thank you, Philip. Your friendship and guidance through this year has made it so much easier. I also want to thank my executive council. I've already bragged on Rebecca McKinney many times, but I want to brag on her again because she's just been a rock and a wonderful voice of reason this year. DeAndre DeBrasse was also my executive council. She's from Birmingham, and she's somebody you always want to have in the trenches with you if you're in the trenches. George Parker, I mentioned, was very in charge of the member benefits and did a great job with that. Cliff Mendham from down in Dothan was the voice of reason in the group, even if that voice sometimes had a musical beat because of <laughs> Cliff's beatbox uh, tendencies. Robert Shreve was the Young Lawyers President, and he was a great um, advocate as well for all the things the young lawyers need to do. And Glenda Freeman, who was the Alabama Lawyers Association, immediate, she's now the immediate past president, she was the president of the Alabama Lawyers Association this year. And so thank you to all of those. I want to thank my law partners and the employees of our firm, Jinx, Crow, and Dixon. I have many of them up there in the balcony watching. I could not be here without you. I would not be here without you. And your support through this journey has been incredible. Thank you to my husband, Van, who's also up in the balcony, and to my children for their love and support this year and in all things in my life. And thank you to every member of the Alabama State Bar who answered the call to service to their profession when the bar asked. Because we work together and because we are better together, we have changed the future of our profession. And now it is my distinct honor to introduce our president-elect. Many of you already know him. Bob Meffin practices in Birmingham and has been on the Bar Commission for a number of years. He was also the Young Lawyers President right before me. So we kind of switched order in this one, but he was, has served as the Young Lawyers President, president and he has a servant heart. So you, you will see that his leadership during this pandemic and during these unprecedented times 
will certainly come through. Congratulations, Bob Miffin. The podium is yours. Incoming President Bob Methan, will you and your family please join us here at the podium? And why does the family move around here for a picture on this side? And Bob, if you would please raise your right hand. Okay. And repeat after me. I state your name. I, Robert Gordon Methan, Jr. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Alabama and the Constitution of the State of Alabama so long as I continue a citizen thereof so long as I continue a citizen thereof and that I will honor the courts of Alabama and that I will honor the courts of Alabama and the legal profession and the citizens they serve and the legal profession and the citizens they serve I will strive to improve the law strive to improve the law and make our legal system available to all and make our legal system available to all and that I will honestly discharge the duties and that I will honestly discharge the duties of the office of president of the Alabama State Bar of the office of the president of the Alabama State Bar upon which I'm about to enter upon which I'm about to enter so help me god so help me god congratulations president method Good morning, everyone. I am humbled and honored to be the 145th president of the Alabama State Bar. Thank you, Chief Justice Parker and all of the associate justices for allowing us to have our grand convocation here today on the 200th anniversary of the Alabama Supreme Court. We have had a great working relationship over the past few years and Chief, I promise you, I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure we keep that great relationship. So thank you for all you do for the State Bar Every single year for over 140 years, including a Great Depression and two world wars, we have had an in-person annual meeting, except for this year. So if I accomplish nothing else, I can at least say that I was the first and hopefully the only president to be inducted at a virtual annual meeting. The irony of this statement is not lost on those who are very familiar with my lack of tech skills. In fact, <laughs> Last night, when I was up at the office finishing my speech, I realized on my laptop I don't know how to save anything. So I called Kate, my high school daughter, and uh, said, hey, Kate, what do I need to do? She gave me instructions and said, Dad, here's how you save it, but if you don't save it right and you, close, and you shut down your computer, you're going to lose everything. And I was like, well, that's not good. So what I did was I took my laptop and I never closed it. I took it out to my truck and I stuck it on the floorboard of my truck and I drove home very carefully, make sure it didn't get knocked around. And I got in and, well, where's Kate? So I got Kate, she came in and she saved it and then she actually printed it for me, which I couldn't do either. But uh, so that's what kind of tech person I am. So those of you who know me well know that I tend to laugh a lot and I love a good party. And I really miss the camaraderie and the social events that we have come to enjoy at every annual meeting. I really hate that my whole family and my extended family couldn't all be together at Sandestin this year. But my whole family looks forward to all of us getting together next year uh, at the Grand Hotel. There's so many people I want to thank and recognize, and I'm going to start with my wonderful family. I really could not be here without them. But right now, we're, we're down one. Hope, my oldest daughter, unfortunately, uh, is quarantined with coronavirus. But I have not been around her, so nobody freak out. Uh, she uh, has mild symptoms and is on the road to recovery. But unfortunately, she couldn't be here. Um, 
First person I want to talk about is my incredible wife, Lee, who y'all just saw up here. She has the toughest job of all of us, and she manages our family and our three daughters and makes sure that all of our daughters and I have everything we need. She started the summer break many months ago on March 13th, and so I guarantee you she's ready for all three kids to get back to school. Uh, but she absolutely hates the spotlight. And so the only thing I'll say is, Lee, thank you so much for always standing by me and for everything you do for our family. My oldest daughter, Hope, I just mentioned, uh, just finished her freshman year at Alabama. And she did not envision her second semester of her freshman year being coming back from Tuscaloosa to live at home in Birmingham with her parents. But she missed all the spring parties, which she hated, but she's handled all that with grace. My middle daughter, Kate, who I've mentioned is a rising junior in high school. She spent her time off working on her culinary skills and her artwork. And uh, last season, her soccer season got cut way too short, so she's looking forward to getting back and playing soccer. My youngest daughter, Lane, who's also here, is a rising sixth grader and is now a TikTok video expert during the, during the pandemic. I've tried to make sure that I'm not in any of those that go viral, but there are probably some out there. Uh, I know she's ready to get back to playing basketball and soccer. And I never thought I would hear, I never thought I'd hear Kate and Lane say this, but they actually miss school. And they want to get back to so they can see their teachers and their friends on a regular basis. And so hopefully that's going to happen this year. Next is my dad, Big Bob. He's 82 years old, and he's in Mobile watching us right now. So dad, thank you so much for all you've done to get me where I am today. You taught me so much about integrity and character, as well as the importance of a great work ethic and the value of seeing someone else's opinion. No matter how busy you were, you, were always, you always made time for our family, and I truly would not be here today if you had not been such a great disciplinarian and a strong disciplinarian. Thanks for never giving up on me. Next is my mother, Claudia. She is one of the best people to ever walk this earth, period. She was a teacher for 40 years and a superstar mother to boot. I've worked hard to pass on to my daughters the values that she instilled in me. She taught me to always look for the good in other people, but she also taught me to always help the less fortunate. Whenever she went to help people, she never talked about it but she always put her kids in the car and she took us with her. She truly led by example. Most importantly, she taught me that I was no better than any other person in the eyes of the Lord. All human beings have value. And that message seems particularly relevant today. She's in heaven right now, smiling down upon us, Probably not real sure how I got here, but very proud nonetheless. My sister Lindsay and my brother Tom are here today. Our parents did something right because we're so close. This may be because no one else can stand to be around us, but we remain close nonetheless. Lindsay lives in Mobile and is a wonderful mother to her three daughters and is also a poet, an author, and an artist. Tom is a lawyer in Montgomery and is also past president of the Alabama State Bar. So as best we can tell, we're the only brother Alabama State Bar presidents in history. Fortunately for me, Tom set the bar for achievement awfully low. So, <laughs> so I shouldn't have any problem exceeding every single thing he did. <laughs> but seriously, Tom got a lot done during his tenure and I hope that I can do the same. Most of you in this room know that I absolutely love lawyers and I come from generations of lawyers and judges on both sides of my family and that the practice of law is in my blood. I'm very proud to have my two nephews, Slade Meffin and Rucker Meffin, are rising third years at Cumberland and my niece, Mary Lindsay Hanahan, is practicing law in Nashville. I'm also fortunate to have really great in-laws. Foster and Martha Walker are wonderful people and have always supported me in everything I've done. 
I'm truly blessed and I'm a better person by having them in my family. I'm not going to bore you all with a list of family and extended family uh, that would be here today if we're all together in Sandestin, but I'm hopeful that we can all, they'll all be there when we're together next year at the Grand Hotel. <clears throat> next is my law firm family. Thank you guys for all the help and support y'all have given me so far, and thank you in advance for everything you're going to do work-wise for me when I can't be there next year. Uh, we're a very tight-knit group of eight lawyers, and I've already gone off script a little bit, and the reason I've done that is so I can see their faces, because it always freaks them out when I say something they don't know I'm going to say. So I appreciate all you guys and everything that y'all do for me. Christy Crow is an absolute rock star and amazing, was totally amazing as a bar president. You have an incredible amount of energy, but you also have great temperament and great judgment. And I always tell my kids, you never stop learning. And I learned so much from just watching her work last year. I was sitting there thinking, you know, Christy, I wouldn't make that decision. That's, uh, that ain't going to work. And then, of course, about a month later, it would be proved that she was right and I was wrong. So I've learned a ton from Christy. And I understand I have very huge shoes to fill, and I'll do my best. Philip and Roman and the bar staff, thank you all for everything, and I look forward to working with you all this year. And to all my friends on the Bar Commission, it has been one of the highlights of my legal career for the last eight years to be able to spend time with all of you all on the Bar Commission. I'm going to need your support and guidance this year, but I'm also looking forward to working with all of you. So thank you for everything. Last July 20th, when I delivered my remarks as president-elect, I had no idea of the changes that would transpire in the world. We are now in the midst of a pandemic and social unrest. As a result of these monumental changes, my goals have changed. And I now have three major initiatives. The first is unity. The second is helping lawyers adapt to a new norm. And the third is lawyer public relations. First, I want to discuss unity. We should seek to unify as a state and as a nation. So the question is, what are we as a state bar association going to do about it? I certainly don't have, have all the answers, but my answer, at least for now, is we're going to seek to unify through diversity. We as lawyers stand for justice and fairness and we stand against those who seek to tear down the rule of law. Brian Stevenson, when he spoke to us last year, made us all proud as he detailed his quest to remedy injustices of the wrongly accused. Racism, inequality, and unfairness have absolutely no place in our justice system. These misguided concepts are an affront to human dignity, and they are counter to the mission of the Alabama State Bar. We're watching history unfold before our very eyes, and we, the lawyers of the Alabama State Bar Association, are going to do everything we can to be on the right side of history. Mahatma Gandhi, a leader who mobilized international change, said, our ability to reach unity and diversity will be the beauty and the test of our civilization. With lawyers throughout history being agents for positive change, it's not surprising that Gandhi was also a lawyer. We as a state bar association will do at least two things in our attempt to unify through diversity. First, we're going to put a lawyer in every classroom to talk about a number of topics, including unity, diversity, inclusion, and tolerance, as well as the importance of the rule of law peaceful protest, and peaceful conflict resolution. Next, I am appointing a presidential council on unity and diversity. This group will provide guidance to our executive council on these issues. Cassandra Adams from Birmingham, Hillary Armstrong from Montgomery, and Ricardo Woods from Mobile will be the three members of this council. They will work with our existing diversity and inclusion task force to make appropriate recommendations for action. 
I echo the comments of Philip McCallum, our executive director, in the most recent State Bar message. The Alabama State Bar stands in solidarity with our members of color, and we add our collective voice with all who demand justice and an end to the use of excessive force. My goal this year for the State Bar is for us to engage, for us to listen, for us to learn, and for us to grow better together. My second initiative will be helping lawyers adapt to a new norm. We as a profession are facing struggles just like many other sectors of the economy. Change is here to stay for a while, folks. There will be no jury trials until at least September. Hopefully, we can have them in September. Lawyers and judges are trying to get used to Zoom hearings. In-person contact has been severely restricted with our clients and with each other. The traditional way that we have grown accustomed to practicing law has been turned on its head. However, the great thing about the legal profession is that we know how to adapt to change. We as a profession will improvise, we will adapt, and we will persevere. Continuing education will continue to be a focus this year as we learn to adapt to this new norm. We'll continue providing CLEs on technology, especially with regard to working remotely, and we will also continue CLEs on attorney wellness. Importantly, in an attempt to help those struggling financially, we will have 12 hours of free CLE online so that lawyers can get their requirement this year free of charge. I will also reappoint the COVID-19 Bench and Bar Task Force, which was originally appointed by Christie. This task force was made up of lawyers, trial judges, and Supreme Court justices. We worked very quickly to come up with best practices for many issues presented by the pandemic. I look forward to working with them again as we try to ensure that jury trials can proceed in the most safe and effective manner throughout the state. I will also appoint a COVID-19 task force, which is made up of only lawyers. This task force will reach out to lawyers all across the state in an attempt to identify issues that are important to lawyers. They will develop best practices and solutions to these issues. Gene Rosardi, Clay Martin, and Tom Perry will be co-chairs of this task force and I expect them to be very, very busy and very productive as well. The third initiative is something I'm very passionate about, is what I call lawyer public relations. We will continue to seek to improve the image of lawyers by highlighting the great deeds that lawyers do every single day. There are three main areas we're gonna talk about. First, we're gonna highlight the fact that virtually every corporate, charitable, and school board in this state has at least one lawyer on it. Lawyers are in leadership positions in pretty much every religious organization in this state. We are involved as coaches and leaders uh, in youth sports and youth organizations. So the question is, why is that? And the answer is because lawyers render service, which is our motto and lawyers like to give back to our communities and our state as a whole. We are sought by these organizations because we are trained to lead and because we have a unique skill set that is designed to solve problems. In my opinion, lawyers give back more than any other profession in this state. Second, we've hired Dr. Sam Addy at the University of Alabama to conduct an economic impact uh, report on the legal profession. We expect this report to show that the legal profession is one of the largest economic engines in the entire state and that we contribute billions of dollars every single year to the Alabama economy. Third is pro bono. My heart is right and this is where it comes from my mother, and also this was a big initiative for my brother back when he was bar president. We'll be highlighting the fact that lawyers donate millions of dollars each year in their time in the form of pro bono legal services. I'm also appointing two new pro bono task forces. The first is, will be called Helping Heroes in Healthcare. We'll be providing free legal work 
to our frontline medical responders and personnel who have given so much to our state during this pandemic. The second pro bono task force is called Lawyer Voices for Survivors, which is our anti-human trafficking task force. LaBella McCallum is very passionate about this issue and she's agreed to chair this task force this year. They will provide free legal, legal services to survivors of human trafficking. Many people are not aware that human trafficking has become a huge problem in the state of Alabama. And so we as a state bar association will do our part to educate the public and to help those survivors. In addition to these three initiatives, we're gonna to continue to focus on attorney wellness, especially as we adapt to this new norm. We as lawyers are so concerned about taking care of others that we often forget to take care of ourselves. We need to take care of ourselves both mentally and physically so that we can then take care of our clients and better serve the public. In conclusion, there are many challenges that lie ahead of us this year. We will meet these challenges head on. We will prevail and our bar association will be stronger as a result. I consider myself to be very blessed to be a member of the greatest profession in this country. And I'm humbled by the trust you have placed in me as bar president. I look forward to serving all of you as the 145th president of the Alabama State Bar. Thank you. Thank you as well, Chief. I want to thank our goal sponsors this year, Law Pay and AIM, Attorneys Insurance Mutual of the South. I also want to thank our silver sponsors, Clio and Veritext, and our bronze sponsors this year, the ABA Retirement Fund, the Alabama Association for Justice, and Fast Case. We'd also like to thank ISI and Bill Bass for this year's grand prize. I think we're ready for the drawing. <laughs> All right. Philip McCallum, <laughs> uh, Paul Pinion is our winner this year. <laughs> All right, I want to put a plug in for our uh, next annual meeting 2021 from July 13th through the 19th at the Grand Hotel in Point Clear. So hopefully we'll all be there together next year. So my first official act as bar president is to adjourn the first and hopefully the only virtual annual meeting. So everyone, thank you for being here and please travel safely. <laughs>